The developers of Baldur's Gate 3 spent countless hours adding hundreds of unique attacks to the game, only for us players to get stuck using the same ones over and over. But what if every action in the game was restricted to just a single use? Can you beat Baldur's Gate 3 without using the same action twice? During this challenge, I have tracked each of my actions, both in and out of combat, so I can know which of my actions I've used already. And for fun, I'll be showing the total actions used in the top left corner at all times. For my rule set, an action is considered to be unique as long as it has a different name in the combat log. For example, the spell command has a few variants, so command flee, drop, grovel, etc. will all count as a different spell. And if two actions look the exact same, that's okay. I'm going off of their names only. Scrolls do not grant me a second use of any spell. They instead take the place of said spell. All other consumable items are also one-time use and have been tracked separately from my spellbook actions. Now with all that out of the way, let's begin. I started the game as a dragonborn sorcerer, but don't get too attached as I'll need to frequently change classes to make any progress. The biggest threat for this challenge is running out of usable actions and potentially becoming softlocked. Knowing that risk, I roleplayed as a lizard punching bag to get through the prologue without using a single action. Once on the shore, I recruited Shadowheart and took a moment to weigh my options. Since I only get one jump, the cliff is not viable. I also didn't want to waste my only lockpick this early, leaving combat as the only real choice. And to be honest, the first battle made me question if there's going to be any viability to this challenge whatsoever, as it would take several spells and cantrips just to clear them, a total of six actions. A victory, but it didn't feel like one. Using dialogue, I stomped out a Mind Flare, making me a little happier, as any experience with no action cost is a win. Then I met with Asterion, freed Gale from his portal, decided Lazel isn't worth wasting an action point on, and as per usual in these challenge runs, I did absolutely nothing but leech experience at the Druid's gates while Will died in the fight. Only this time, I'm refusing to use my only resurrection scroll on him. Asterion died too, but since he's in the party already, at least Withers can get him later. Pulling the YouTuber special, I cast Disguise Self to turn into a drow, skipping all the dialogue checks with the goblins to reach level 3. From here, I decided limiting the goblin leaders is a worthwhile investment as it opens up many additional quests down the road. With that goal in mind, I roleplayed as a prisoner of Priestess Gut, she slapped the shit out of me, but Raphael's girl slit her throat in response, bailing me out and downing one leader for free. Gut's bedroom grants access to the under dark, so I quickly grabbed the waypoint and stole a kill on a minotaur using Witch Bolt to reach level 4. I picked up the ability improvement feat, because I really can't afford to have my spells miss, then returned to the goblin camp to trick Minthara into thinking I'll join her, causing her to walk right into the Looney Tunes classic. And using Minor Illusion, a fake cat lured the final leader into an area that really should have had safety railings, allowing Gale to thunderwave him into next week. The goblins reciprocated by chasing me back, but the job was already done. With the goblin leaders down, I was already in position to enter the mountain pass, skipping any further possible confrontations with these aggravated goblins. This did also mean that we're going to miss our tiefling sex party, but sometimes logical decision making and excel spreadsheeting takes priority over a single night of debauchery. We found Lazelle waiting for us in the mountain pass, so I invited her to join the camp, then returned to Act 1 through the other mountain pass pathway to deceive the man with the Vegeta looking haircut to get into Walken's rest. It was too late to save Counselor Floric, but that's mainly the fault of whatever these three stooges were doing. I wrapped up the area by mind controlling a knoll for a bit more dialogue experience, and then returned to the Underdark. We ran directly through the laser beams, managed to slip past the detection of a Minotaur without having to stealth, and rather than shooting the exploding mushrooms from a safe distance like anyone with a brain would do, I implemented a unique face tank approach. It went better than expected. Once at the colony, I selflessly gave my only antidote to a sick gnome and used Mage Hand to save a forgetful man. Setting sail for Grimforge, we used Jedi mind tricks to confuse the dwarves, and soon after, I made the first blunder of the run. The plan here was to use Speak with Animals to speak with these rams, because I knew that they destroy the rocks and I get free XP, but I totally forgot that the dwarves betray you afterwards. This mistake would cost me 6 additional actions, but thankfully, the Rothe did do most of the work. Still level 4, I figured the Githyanki Crash would be well worth its entrance fee, but to get inside without jumping, you need to do battle with a couple Gith at the door. By using the attack button during the cutscene, we can force them to fight us while the door is still open, but by no means is this a simple engagement. Cloud of Daggers is an extremely valuable spell, and in this situation, it managed to pull off 67 damage when combined with Shadowheart's crowd control spells. Taking 10 actions to get these two down ended up being the most costly encounter of Act 1. Entering the crush and passing the dialogue check got us to level 5, along with a new tier of spells for my choosing. I also took their egg, bought some gear, and forced Lazelle to use the Zathisk because there's no way in hell I'm going to pass all those rolls. She took the permanent stat hit for us, and with that, I sent her back to camp where she'll never contribute to my story ever again. If there's a way to efficiently deal with the undead in the mountain pass, I sure as hell didn't know it, so I fast traveled to Grimforge to take the elevator path instead. 
Though quite underleveled, we braved on and into the Shadow Cursed Lands. Act 2 begins immediately with a forced encounter with several shadow creatures of the zone. I sent Shadowheart in alone with the Spirit Guardian spell active, combining it with Dash to guarantee she could land some extra hits and save the Harpers. Before the spell ran out, I made sure to bolt it into combat with the Ravens nearby. This way Spirit Guardians could solo two entire encounters for just one cast. Deceiving the Drider into giving us the Moon Lantern was clearly the optimal play, granting us the Pixie's Blessing and safe travel to Moonrise. Moonrise Towers is the first area of the game that combat is basically mandatory. I say basically because while there are ways to skip these encounters, they would cost me extremely valuable spells which I'm not yet willing to part with. So with that, I got prepared to take out the trash in Moonrise Towers. My 33rd action of the run was also the first crit of the run, and for the very first time in the history of Baldur's Gate 3, I was excited to use the Way of the Four Elements Monk. They get exact copies of all the wizard spells, but they have unique names. You think that's Ice Knife? No, that's a Blade of Rhyme. So with my rule set, this makes the Four Elements Monk subclass one of the most powerful ones in the entire game. You'll never hear anybody say that again. Moonrise Towers was quickly becoming a pain in the ass. In just four battles, I had used more actions than I did in the entirety of Act 1. I tried to rethink what I was doing a bit by implementing area of effect attacks more often, quickly increasing my efficiency. And it's here that I discovered a totally new technique. It's possible to lure enemies by moving stolen objects, as they'll always go to pick it up after it's been touched. Like a sketchy white van offering candy to children, this prison warden could not resist the obvious bait. I used the charge shove feet to push her off the ledge. Can honestly say I've never used that feat before. I also used the normal shove action on the final guard nearby to stage a rather ridiculous prison break. I handed Woolborn a torch, he smashed the walls down with said torch, then no one helped this poor tiefling who tried so damn hard to get this boat free. Not even me, cause you know, the action economy's kinda rough these days. Going back upstairs and slaying Zarel got us to level 6, and I figured this should be enough of Moonrise cleared out that the Harpers can carry me to victory later. Act 2 isn't all bad though. I was able to scoop up a lot of free dialogue XP from speaking with the bartender, tollkeeper, and doctor before descending into Lady Shar's gauntlet. Normally, Balthazar's undead will start combat immediately upon speaking with them, but by using the spell Gaseous Form, there's a side effect where you don't have a vocal component making both dialogues entirely skippable, but I didn't really want to skip the second one. In the second room, I left the form while standing in his bedroom door, triggering Shar's ambush on us. This was where I would use the only lockpick that I'm allowed to deal with Balthazar. Once he finally got out of the room, I used Arcane Lock on the door to block his minion, Flesh, from helping out. This way, I could guarantee his death. After a short six-turn nap, Balthazar was slain by Shar's undead. While waiting for the door to unlock, they formed up to finish off Flesh in a pretty cool way. You don't really see the AI group up like this, and it was so hard to resist fireballing it. With none of them being mandatory enemies, I played it safe and left them alive. Handling the Gauntlet of Shar, I was presented with four options of which to start, and when you briefly look at each, there's only one that can be completed without wasting any actions whatsoever. Amazingly, I completed it in one try. Then using the orb to activate the elevator, immediately glitched and Karlak fell through the floor. Since I had no way to reach her, I had to reload. Lyrian, when are you gonna fix this elevator bug, man? Round two? Karlak didn't glitch out, we beat the elevator boss, and using knock I opened the final door. This does mean that I could never open a locked door ever again in this run, but that's a problem for future proxy. Before entering the Shadowfell, I made a last minute decision to use Repulsor, pushing Gale down one level so that he could talk Yurgur to death, since value like that is tough to beat. Then I dismissed all my companions in preparation for the first of several mandatory jumping puzzles in the game. You might be confused when I say that Baldur's Gate 3 has jumping puzzles, but when mobility actions are limited and there's several areas like this in the game, it should hopefully be pretty clear as to why I've been so hesitant to use jump. I began the puzzle by casting Goodberry. Bet you didn't expect that. This spell activates the Storm Sorcerer's Tempest Just Magic Flight spell. Then using the patented Proxy Boxy trick, I dropped to the next platform. A long distance jump could reach the fifth space rock, bypassing the fourth. Improvised melee swinging an alchemist fire onto an explosive barrel blasted me to the sixth, and Misty Step completed the first parkour mission of the game. I spoke with Nightsong, set her free, and since magical spears weren't in the budget, permanently said goodbye to Shadowheart. With Kethric vulnerable, it was time to help the Harpers storm Moonrise. This would be the beginning of five back-to-back -back mandatory encounters, but I have allies at my side to fight with me. They're admittedly pretty shit allies, but allies nonetheless. The first room is set up in such a way that fighting indoors would not be favorable whatsoever. As a Protoss player, I'm quite familiar with constructing walls. Using chests, I built one to block my allies from entering the room, not realizing it was pointless as they would teleport in anyways. Well, I tried. They got absolutely slaughtered, without downing a single foe. But afterwards, the enemies made their way to me through a spike growth hunger of Hadar combo, which brutalized everyone who tried to get through, except for this guy. 
but the quartermaster, being a tactical genius, stayed outside with me, finished them off, and then ran into my own spike growth and died afterwards. Okay, I spoke too soon. Not a genius. All in all, the first battle was complete. Six enemies down for five actions, plus all the allies that I expected would carry the next three fights. The second battle in Moonrise didn't go much better. I rushed in so that spike growth would remain active, used Crown of Madness to force one enemy to slay his friend, but when spike growth disappeared and the enemies got close, combat got pretty tricky. This second battle took a total of 15 actions, but hey, sometimes you gotta get behind to get ahead. On to the third set of guards, it's just a few weak skelly boys and a lone necromancer. No problem, right? I used darkness to get into a better position, because the last thing I want is for her to summon additional enemies. Started with a glyph of fire, and moonbeam. Move Moonbeam helped a bit, because yes, that is a different name for the action in the combat log, Arabella's Shadow Entangle did absolutely nothing, and despite my best efforts, the Necromancer still summoned an additional enemy. But then she walked back into Moonbeam after, so it worked out better than expected. To finish this fight off, I had to use Lightning Ward on a lone skeleton which felt terrible, but 15 actions won this fight too. With all the guards down, it's time for the first encounter with Kethrick. Gale began with the Haste spell on Aelin, followed by getting the hell out of Dodge. Preserve Life buffed us all with Bless, and restored Aelin's health while a summoned bear companion's honeyed paws landed a disarm on Kethrick. More importantly though, it used his shield bash reaction so that he couldn't interrupt Aelin's turn. This allowed Aelin to smash the geriatric necromancer down in just four swings. At least one NPC in Moonrise actually did something useful. Kethrick fled the battle, and Gale booked it out the door, leaving the remaining team members to die. This was no problem though, as the remaining enemies on this rooftop are all optional. Withers made bank reviving us and changing all my classes in preparation for the Moonrise colony. Using Cloak of Shadows, a monk spell which is basically invisibility, but not named invisibility, we snuck in to pursue Kethrick. Somehow this bugged my game out, causing Astarian to be in a state of endless combat, but that's not a problem, I don't actually need him anyways. I went straight to the flesh rot door, only to get the message that a party member is not ready. <sighs> Once again, this damn door is a problem. It took 19 rounds of painful, agonizing movement to get Astarian near enemies who then refused to hit him, costing me a fire arrow and three more rounds of combat just so I could get him to die. But with him dead, the door is finally open. Fast forward past the Power Rangers cosplay and right into the second hardest encounter of Act 2. At level 7, this fight is normally pure hell, but I'm a tactician, so I came prepared with some tactical cheddar. Casting Fog, Karlak was able to avoid detection and move into position. Then Shadow Arts Darkness, a totally different spell than Darkness, was placed next to Kethrick. Gale snuck up to Kethrick using hide and reverse pickpocketed him 112,000 gold. Using friends, I convinced Kethrick to give up, spawning Merkel immediately. Turn 1, Karlak's already close to Night Song, climbed up the ladder and used the help action. And Gale dropped the darkness spell to use Blood Money. Blood Money deals 3 damage per 300 gold in the target's inventory. Using ethically sourced and naturally exploited gold, I donated it all to Kethrick to set up a 565 damage attack to complete the fight, one-shotting Merkel. So yeah, I exploited. I'm level 7, I don't care. With him down, it was time to hit the road to Baldur's Gate. Much like the dozens of awful mobile games that keep emailing me sponsorship deals, I left the Act 3 warning message on Ignore to begin the Gith Yankee camp ambush. Gale got caught sleeping in his undies, so he didn't survive the encounter, but that was actually part of my master plan. We made it into the portal using the monk's step of the wind dash action. Our reward? Jumping Puzzle 2.0. First thing I did was use the True Love Rings from Act 2 to cast Warding Bond on Astarian. I picked up Gale's corpse and Dimension Door to Astarian with me to the second stage. From here, I can use Fly, which is a totally different ability than Tempest Just Fly, and a lot easier to pronounce. I also used a Transposition Arrow to skip directly to the end of the puzzle. It's here that I drop Gale's lifeless body on the floor to make him a life full body again. A couple short rests later, and it's time to take on one of the hardest mandatory encounters in the game. Gale initiated the fight with the Fist of Thunders to knock their leader out of the map, while the Emperor did literally nothing for two turns in a row. My attempts at crowd control repeatedly failed, as did trying to push this dude off with the Fist of Unbroken Air. But at least the Emperor decided to finally do something and land a stun on one turn and a massive chain lightning on the next. A clutch cloud kill got us an unexpected second kill, and the Emperor secured a third. Things were looking up, but this last enemy quickly got me into a 1v1 scenario. She landed attack after attack, while my retaliation was pitiful at best. We were quickly left with just 12 HP. And remember, Karlak was taking half of all my damage during this. My final attack missed. But the Emperor saved the day. Against all odds, we had survived the Githyanki intermission. The Emperor immediately forced us into a dialogue, then explained that he can only speak with the party leader, who's dead. I panicked, thinking I'm screwed, but apparently he auto-revives your party leader after this fight. Thank you, Larian, for that. At a cost of 25 actions, this was a new record for one encounter. Just a quick reminder, all of Act 1 was 28 actions. Could there even be enough left to get through Act 3? I guess we'll find out. Beginning Act 3 as a cat, 
I felt right at home. Cats are able to speak with the strange ox, and they can walk right past the initial guards because they ignore small wild shaped creatures. Sweet talking a second guard got us into Worms Crossing, where we agreed to an alliance with Gortash, because being bad is oftentimes efficient. Continuing this evil streak, we acid breathed down an elderly woman to start the assassin quest line, then hushed a pirate because I needed her hand. But before we could face the murder tribunal, a dwarf assassin stood in our way. Up until this point, I had crit a total of seven times in this entire playthrough. But Karlak stepped up big time here, landing three crits in a row, turning that encounter into just a blip on the radar. After presenting our victim's hands to Balls Chosen, we're tasked with slaying Investigator Dumbo over here. Wall of Fire works wonders when your enemy is chained up and can't move. God, that sounded really evil. A few skip turns later, and we're level 8 unholy assassins with Balls Amulet in hand. I had the key to reach Orin, but I needed to hit level 9 to be ready for her. Luring enemies into Gortash's steel watch worked well, as did the massive chunks of dialogue XP available in Act 3, especially the one from the sewer folk. Dialogue alone got me through all of level 8 without using a single action. Level 9 would be necessary, because it's the first level that the elixir of cloud giant strength shows up on the vendors, and it's also the first time the 6th level spell slots show up. With our new tools, all the preparations were complete to face Orin. As a level 9 thief, we gained access to Supreme Sneak to skip through the fight before the temple. We opened the door using the amulet, and a Astarian got his drink on. This elixir boosts his strength ability score to 27. Combined with the greater invisibility spell on him, he now had enough strength to execute a throw command on Orin. She dies instantly, dropping her nether stone and the key to save Lizelle. Oh yeah, she got kidnapped. But since the rest of the enemies in this area would be too costly to clear out, we uh, kinda left her for dead. With Orin down, I informed Gortash of the good news, prompting him to give us the final boss's location. I spent the next half hour calculating my remaining options to get through the game, then set sail for the Morphic Pool. I didn't have any reasonable way to skip the Intellect Devourer ambush, but as you'll see soon, saving my spells is pointless anyways. One Ice Storm, a Cone of Cold, and a Displacer Beast Tentacle Whip were all it took to cut down these devourers, and begin the next jumping puzzle. Displacer Beast form has access to a teleport, which is why I felt comfortable using it to end the previous fight, and Wild Shape Badger allowed me to use Burrow to skip to the next gap in the road. Badgering on with Gortash at our side, we confronted the brain. We tried to dominate it, failed, Gortash died, and the Emperor saved us, pulling us into another jumping puzzle. This time I had my hidden tech, the Bone Spike Boots. These boots grant me the brutal leap action to clear the gap and reach the Emperor. It's here that we relinquish the stones and he followed our lead back to the city. And if you like janky idiotic nonsense, then this is the section for you. You're in for a wild ride. First things first, we need to ditch our clingy mind flayer ally, because if he follows me, it's not going to go well for him. Using a sofa and a couple of chairs, I trapped him against his will. Wild Shape Panther has all the tools necessary for the final stretch of the game. Prowl is a permanent invisibility action, allowing me to walk all the way to the end. And the Panther has a unique version of jump called Enhanced Jump. Using Enhanced Jump, I could reach the ledge and skip the entire... Okay, apparently Enhanced Jump breaks invisibility. How is that enhanced when normal jump doesn't do that? What part of this exactly was enhanced? So, I can't fully skip the gauntlet. No problem, I have Sanctuary as a backup plan. Sanctuary is a spell that makes you untargetable. Uh, what? Okay. These enemies can apparently cast Phantasmal Killer on me through Sanctuary, and the brain mobs can straight up attack me through Sanctuary. That has to be a bug, right? I honestly spent an hour trying to brute force this section by reloading and trying again and reloading and trying again, but it was impossible since both my plans had failed and in my opinion, this was clearly just a bug. I went back to the drawing boards. Turns out I had protection from evil and good on Asterion all along, which makes you immune to terrify. This time I could make it through as I wasn't getting chain rooted, but these little brains were still attacking me through Sanctuary. Luckily, all it takes is to reach the door though, and all the enemies despawn. One pain in the ass down, one to go. As a side note, in patch 6, Larian made it so you can't invisibly click up the brain anymore to cheese the final fight. They tried to fix it anyways. It's time to get janky. Step 1. Free the Emperor from the couch. Step 2. Group up in a circle around a Psychic Resist Elixir, Magic Missile it, and then place an Invisibility Potion in its place. Step 3. Gale and I impersonate every hunter you've ever raided with in World of Warcraft. Step 4. Frog and Metal Dwarf Man get summoned. Step 5. Ascend the Brain with one health on me and a dead Gale. Yes, he has to be dead. Now that the cutscene's active, in the bottom left we can select to change our character to Gale, as he is dead and not part of the cutscene. This allows you to select your summoned creatures, who are also not part of the cutscene. The Frog then uses the Buo Toxin action on the Invisibility Potion, while the Dwarf Man breaks my back. This instantly ends the cutscene, and we're back to the way the fight was meant to be done. The survivors of the party walked up to the crown, channeled the Nether Stones, and nothing happened. The enemies didn't even start combat. Somehow, I'd totally broken the game. I took a wild guess and thought maybe I need to be in combat to use the stones, so I summoned the best boy. Scratch literally saved the run. 
he started combat with only some of the enemies and our portal to the brain opened. I finally used my main hand attack action to destroy some haste spores, then put down a globe of invulnerability. This prevents the brain's platforms from being destroyed, giving us several turns to just focus purely on damage. Being level 9, I needed all the help I could get. I had been saving every unique arrow for this fight, as I figured that's probably the easiest way to burst down the brain since I don't really have any jump actions left. With the Emperor's Telekinesis spell, I was able to get into position to plant a rune powder bomb. The bomb finished the Starion, did a huge chunk of damage to the brain's health, but it would be an arrow of darkness to execute the brain in a total of 20 unique actions. Faerun was saved, and I had beaten Baldur's Gate 3 without ever using the same action twice. All it took was 230 unique actions and 23 unique items. I've included a spreadsheet of all my actions used and some cool extra info below, so if you want to check that out, feel free. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, it really does help out the channel. As always, thanks for watching, have yourself a wonderful day, proxy out.